Hey everyone, welcome back to another dividend investing video. Today I want to take a look at some of what's going on with Dividend King Johnson & Johnson. We put out a video the other day highlighting J&J &J as an intriguing buying opportunity for dividend growth investors, but I realized there are a lot of questions around J&J &J between its pending litigation and its consumer product spinoff. So I wanted to make a quick video to go a little deeper into this one, as a few of you have asked for it. So let's talk J&J. I'm Nick, and this is the Dividend Growth Income Channel. Thank you for joining me today. I'm not a financial advisor or guru. I'm just a regular guy who wants to share my love of dividend growth investing and building financial independence with passive income. If you could, please do me a favor, smash the like button, and subscribe to keep up with future videos. This helps us out more than you can imagine with the algorithm so we can bring you more quality dividend investing content. At the time of publishing, shares of Johnson & Johnson are yielding just about 3%. This is 13% above its five-year average. Here is a chart from Seeking Alpha of J&J's 10-year dividend yield. Notice that aside from the brief moment in time during the 2020 pandemic when everything dropped and then quickly shot back up, the last time we could get J&J at a 3% yield was in January of 2016. This presents a unique opportunity that doesn't come around often. And J&J, &J, this is no ordinary dividend stock. It's long represented something of a standard. This is a dividend king with 60 years of increasing its dividend payment every year and more than a century of paying this dividend uninterrupted. J&J &J is just one of two companies to have a AAA credit rating, the other being Microsoft. Only the highest quality companies could attain this. It even beats out the credit rating of the United States government. Think about that. The upcoming spinoff could, of course, change some things, but that's where they stand today. Shares of J&J &J at the time of publishing are hanging right around that 52-week low, right around the $150 mark. 2023 has not been kind to this company. Shares are down about 15% over the last year. Stick around until the end, and I'll share you what I believe to be J&J's fair value based on a dividend discount model. So what's going on here? First, let's get into litigation concerns. There are a lot of comments and questions concerning this, and I think it's important to understand first that J&J &J has dealt with plenty of litigation throughout its 135-year history. Now, at the moment, there are about 40,000 individual lawsuits against J&J &J alleging that its talc-based baby powders were a factor in causing ovarian cancer. In 2021, J&J &J attempted to limit its exposure to these lawsuits by moving its talc, talc liabilities to a newly created subsidiary called LTL Management, which immediately declared bankruptcy. But in February of 2023, a U.S. appeals court rejected J&J's attempt to offload these lawsuits, causing a setback in this legal battle. And I believe this played a major role in the share price drop we saw back in February. Now, back in 2018, J&J paid out more than $2.5 billion in the first lawsuits that were filed in these matters. But there were also lawsuits that were dismissed and thrown out, while other cases resulted in favorable verdicts for Johnson & Johnson. So it's hard to predict how what the outcome will be in the pending litigation or what the potential financial obligation might look like. So thinking about the worst case scenario here, assuming all 40,000 plaintiffs were to win a settlement, according to Wells Fargo, the largest settlement claim the firm has ever paid out was $280,000. So I see the worst case scenario is J&J &J on the hook for about $11.2 billion in settlements. Absolute worst case, unlikely to go this high. That's assuming every single plaintiff wins their case and gets a settlement at the highest payout that was ever made in their history. Quite unlikely, right? But if this were the case, J&J &J does have the cash on its balance sheet to cover such a liability. And it also maintains low debt and a low payout ratio. The Simply Safe Dividends reaffirmed the dividend safety score of 99 after the appeals court denied J&J's attempt to offload these liabilities to its quote-unquote bankrupt spinoff. And for reference, Johnson & Johnson's dividend last year cost them about $11.6 billion dollars and they brought in about $20 billion in free cash flow. So cash flow is not a problem for this company. And I want to be perfectly clear that with this video, I'm in no way attempting to minimize anyone's ordeal with ovarian cancer. I'm just attempting to look at the facts and what the effects will be on us as shareholders. So the pending litigation at this time does not look like it would have a significant impact 
on Johnson & Johnson's ability to pay their dividend. To find all this info out, the articles from contributors on Seeking Alpha have played a major role as a part of my research. And Seeking Alpha has a lot of great resources for investors. A lot of it is free, but if you want the benefits of their premium membership, you can look. You can check out the link in the description where you can get one year of Seeking Alpha Premium for just $99 for that first year. This comes out to about eight bucks a month and is a wonderful way you can help support my work on this channel. All right, so let's move our attention to the spinoff of J&J's Consumer Health Division. The division is set to spin off into its own company by the end of 2023 under the name Kenview, and shares will be listed on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker KVUE. And these are brands that are likely in your own household and medicine cabinet like Tylenol, Zyrtec, and Band-Aids. Now, for reference, the Consumer Health Division made up 16% of J&J sales in 2021, it's the smallest revenue generator out of J&J's primary business divisions. The reason for the spinoff is the belief that the business units will have better growth opportunities as separate companies. And contrary to popular belief, the Kenview spinoff will not take on most of the talc lawsuit liabilities. J&J will indemnify Kenview for potential talc-related liabilities, limiting Kenview's exposure to claims outside the U.S. and Canada. The liability is going to remain with J&J for the most part. Now, Kenview has announced they are issuing bonds to fund its separation from J&J. On March 8th, they priced an offering on eight senior unsecured notes, which add up to $7.75 billion. They also recently made a filing with the SEC, adding some additional banks to the underwriting on their initial public offering. They initially filed for their IPO on January 3rd. Now, once the stock splits, J&J stock will only give investors exposure to the medical device and pharmaceutical divisions of the company, Well, Kenview will give investors ex exposure to the consumer products company. Now, Simply Safe Dividends did an analysis and does not see the separation of the consumer health business into Kenview having any effect on J&J's dividend policy. And we should be getting a modest dividend increase announcement for J&J's dividend payment in June. We should be hearing about this in the next month, it will be interesting to see if this is on the more conservative side, uh, given the cloud of pending litigation and this upcoming spinoff. But I see no reason that J&J will not retain its Dividend King status post spinoff. And my plan as of now is to hold on to both companies post spinoff. I think there's a potential for this to look similar to an Abbott Labs and AbbVie spinoff that we saw 10 years ago, which resulted in two high quality healthcare companies for investors. Now, let me know down in the comments what do you plan to do with your Kenview shares that you receive from the spinoff? Will you sell? Are you going to hold? Are you going to buy more? And if I were to guess, this spinoff is going to take place in probably October or November. There's no definite date set yet. As for J&J's fair value, one way I like to estimate this is by using a dividend discount model. Now, if I were to assume J&J's growth rate remains in line with where it's been historically, very consistently, and using a 9% discount rate, and I come to an estimated fair value of $159.71. So really about $160, I think, is a good fair value for this company. I'll be keeping an eye on the situation here, adding to my position on dips. Right now, the P.E. ratio is at 14.4, which also makes us look attractively valued. But there's more uncertainty around the stock with some of the issues that we talked about. But this is nothing like the level of difficulties facing a company like 3M. I think the drop in price is a bit of an overreaction. Hey, if you're still here, you are my people. I appreciate you. Please make sure you give this video a like. It really does help us out tremendously with the algorithm. And until next time.